So, hello everybody. Hey, my name is Jeff Posnick, and I'm a member of Google's developer relations team. So I'm here to talk about an important but potentially misunderstood topic, the architecture that you use for your web app, and specifically how your architectural decisions come into play when you're building a progressive web app. So what do I mean by web architecture? Well, one way to think about it is to ask yourself the following questions. When a user visits a page on my site, what HTML is loaded? And then, what's loaded when they visit another page? The answers to those questions are not always straightforward. And once you start thinking about progressive web apps, they can get even more complicated. So my goal during this session is to walk you through one possible architecture that I found effective. Throughout the talk, I'll label the decisions that I made as being my approach for building a progressive web app. You're free to use my approach when building your own PWA, but at the same time, there are always other valid alternatives as well. My hope is that by seeing how all the pieces fit together will inspire you and that you'll feel empowered to go out and customize everything to suit your own particular needs. So what I ended up building to accompany this talk is a Stack Overflow PWA. So I personally spent a lot of time reading and also contributing to Stack Overflow. And I wanted to build a web app that would make it easy to browse through frequently asked questions for a given topic. It's built on top of the public Stack Exchange API, and you can try it out live and view the source code by using the URLs on that slide. OK, so before we get into the specifics of how I built that web app, let's define some terms and explain pieces of underlying technology. First, we're going to be talking about what I like to call multi-page apps, or MPAs. You can think of MPAs as a fancy name for the traditional architecture that's been used really since the beginning of the web. Each time a user navigates to a new URL, the browser progressively renders HTML specific to that page. There's no attempt to preserve the page's state or the content in between navigations. Each time you visit a new page, you're starting fresh. This is in contrast to the single page app model for building web apps, in which the browser runs JavaScript code to update the existing page when the user visits a new section. Now, both SPAs and MPAs are equally valid models for, for you to use. But for this talk, I wanted to explore PWA concepts within the context of a multi-page app, something that we haven't really talked about too much in the past. So next up, you've heard me and certainly countless others use the phrase progressive web app, or PWA. But what do I mean by that exactly? So you can think of a PWA as a web app that provides a first-class user experience and that truly earns a place on a user's home screen. The acronym FIRE, standing for fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging, sums up all the attributes to think about when you're building a PWA. For the purposes of this talk, however, we're going to focus on a subset of those attributes, fast and reliable. While fast means a lot of things in different contexts, we're going to focus on the speed benefits of loading as little as possible from the network. But raw speed isn't enough. In order to feel like a PWA, your web app should be reliable. It needs to be resilient enough to always load something, even if it's just a customized error page, regardless of the state of the network. And finally, we're going to rephrase the PWA definition slightly and look at what it means to build something that's reliably fast. Now, it's not good enough to be fast and reliable only when you're on a low latency network. Being reliably fast means that your web app speed is consistent, regardless of the underlying network conditions. 
So PWA has introduced a high bar for speed and resilience. Fortunately, the web platform offers some building blocks to make that type of performance a reality. And I'm talking, of course, about service workers and the cache storage API. So a service worker sits in between your web application and the network, acting as a proxy that could intercept incoming requests. And what that service worker does is completely up to you. In this basic illustration, the service worker takes incoming requests and forwards them onto the network. It then just returns the network response to the page as is. Now, this trivial service worker doesn't actually add any value versus the default network behavior. But once we add the cache storage API into the mix, the power of service workers shine through. So we can build a service worker that listens for incoming requests, like before, passing some onto the network. But instead of just returning the network response to the page, we could write a service worker that stores a copy of the response for future use via the cache storage API. Next time our web app makes the same request, our service worker can check its caches and just return the previously cached response. So avoiding the network whenever possible is a crucial part of offering reliably fast performance. One more concept that I want to cover is what's sometimes referred to as isomorphic or universal JavaScript. There's not a great name for it. Um, simply put, it's the idea that the same JavaScript code can be shared between different runtime environments. So when I built my PWA, I wanted to share JavaScript code between my backend server and the service worker. There are lots of valid approaches to sharing code in this way, but the approach that worked for me was to use EF's modules as a definitive source code. I then transpiled and bundled those modules for the server and for the service worker using a combination of Babel and Rollup. So in my slides, when you see an MJS file extension, we're talking about code that lives in an ES module. So keeping those concepts and terminology in mind, let's dive into how I actually built my Stack Overflow PWA. We're going to start by covering our backend server and explain how that fits into the overall architecture. So I was looking for a combination of dy a dynamic backends along with static hosting. And my personal approach was to use the Firebase platform. Firebase cloud functions will automatically spin up a node-based environment when there's an incoming request. And it integrates with a popular Express HTTP framework, which I was already familiar with. It also offers out-of-the-box hosting for all of my site's static assets. And let's take a look at how that server handles incoming requests. So when a browser makes a navigation request against our server, it goes through the following flow. The server routes the request based on the URL, and it uses templating logic to, complete, to create a complete HTML document. We use a combination of data from the Stack Exchange API as well as partial HTML fragments that the server stores locally. So once we know how to respond, we start streaming HTML back to our web app. So there are two pieces of this picture worth exploring in more detail, routing and templating. When it comes to routing, my approach was to use the Express Framework's native routing syntax. It's flexible enough to match simple URL prefixes, as well as URLs that include parameters, such as you know, the question ID as part of the path. As mentioned earlier, we're using ES modules as a source of truth for my isomorphic JavaScript code. Here, we create a mapping between route names and the underlying express pattern to match against. <clears throat> 
I can then reference this mapping directly from the server's code. When there's a match for a given express pattern, the appropriate handler with templating logic specific to the matching route is given a chance to respond. And what does that templating logic look like? Well, I went with an approach that pieced together partial HTML fragments in sequence, one after another. So this model lends itself really well to streaming response back to the browser. The server sends back some initial HTML boilerplate immediately, and the browser is able to render that partial page right away. As the server pieces together the rest of the data sources, it streams them to the browser as well until the document is complete. So to illustrate what I mean, let's take a look at the express code from one of our routes. By using the responses write method and referencing locally stored partial templates, we're able to start the response stream immediately without blocking on any sort of external data source. So the browser takes this initial HTML and renders a meaningful interface and loading message right away. So that loading please wait message gives important context to our users, but it's not the sort of thing that you might expect to see in a multi-page app. Rather than rely on JavaScript, I'm using the empty pseudo class in the page's CSS to display that message. And then it'll automatically disappear once the real content starts streaming in. So going back to our route handler, the next portion of our page uses data from the Stack Exchange API. Getting that data means that our server needs to make a, ne a network request. We can't render anything else until we get a response back and process it. But at least our user isn't staring at a blank screen while they wait. And once we've received the response from the Stack Exchange API, we call a custom templating function to translate the data from the API into its corresponding HTML. Now, templating can be a surprisingly contentious topic. And what I'm presenting here is just one approach among many. You'll definitely want to substitute in your own solution here, especially if you have legacy ties to an existing templating framework. But what made sense for my use case was to just rely on JavaScript's template literals with some logic broken out into helper functions. So one of the nice things about building an MPA is that we don't have to keep track of state updates and re-render our HTML as things change. So a basic approach that produced static HTML worked fine for me. All right, so here's an example of how I'm templating the dynamic HTML portion of our web apps index. As with our routes, the templating logic is stored in an ES module that can be imported into both the server and the service worker. And just a reminder, when you're, whenever you're taking user-provided input and converting into HTML, it's crucial that you take care to properly escape potentially dangerous character sequences. If you're using an existing templating solution rather than rolling your own, that might already be taken care of for you. OK, so these template functions are pure JavaScript, and it's useful to break out the logic into smaller helper functions when appropriate. Here. I pass each of the items returned in the API response into one such function, which creates a standard HTML element with all of the appropriate attributes set. A particular note is a data attribute that we add to each link set to the Stack Exchange API URL that we need in order to display the corresponding question. Keep that in mind, and we'll, we'll revisit it later on. OK, so jumping back to our route handler, once templating is complete, we stream the final portion of our page's HTML to the browser. 
and we end the stream. This is the cue to the browser that the progressive rendering is complete. OK, so that's a brief tour of our server setup. And users who visit our web app for the first time will always get a response from the server. But when a visitor, ret visitor returns to our web app, our service worker will get a chance to start responding. And let's dive in there. Now, this diagram should look somewhat familiar. Many of the same pieces we previously talked about are here in a slightly different arrangement. Let's walk through the request flow for the service worker, taking all of its logic into account. So our service worker handles an incoming navigation request for a given URL. And just like our server did, it has to use a combination of routing and templating logic to figure out how to respond. The approach is the same as before but with different low-level primitives like fetch and the cache storage API. We use those data sources to construct our HTML response, which the service worker passes back to our web page. So rather than starting from scratch with those low-level primitives, we're going to build our service worker on top of a high level set of high-level libraries called Workbox. So I'm a member of the Workbox engineering team, and this is not exactly unbiased, uh, but I think using Workbox provides a solid foundation for any service worker's caching, routing, and response generation logic. Throughout the next set of slides, we'll see how Workbox is put to use. First, let's cover service worker routing. Just as with our server-side code, our service worker needs to know how to match up an incoming request with the appropriate response logic. My approach was to translate each express route into a corresponding regular expression, making use of a helpful library called regex param. Once that translation is performed, we could take advantage of Workbox's built-in support for regular expression routing. So after importing the module that has our regular expressions, we register each one with Workbox's router. Inside each route, we're able to provide custom templating logic used to generate a response. Templating in the service worker is a bit more involved than it was in our backend server, but Workbox helps with a lot of the heavy lifting. So first, we need to make sure that our partial HTML templates are locally available in the cache storage API and are always kept up to date whenever we deploy changes to our web app. Cache maintenance can be error prone when done by hand, so we turn to Workbox to handle pre caching as part of our build process. We can tell Workbox which URLs to pre cache using a configuration file, pointing to the directory that contains all of our local assets, along with a set of patterns to match. This file is automatically read by the Workbox CLI, which is run each time we rebuild our site as part of my build process. So Workbox takes a snapshot of each file's contents and automatically injects that list of URLs and revisions into our final service worker file. Workbox now has everything it needs to make sure our pre-cache files are always available and always kept up to date. For folks who use a more complex build process, Workbox has both a Webpack as well as a generic node module interface in addition to its command line. All right, so next we want our service worker to stream that pre-cache partial HTML back to the web app immediately without any delays. This is a really crucial part of being reliably fast. We always get something meaningful on the screen right away. Fortunately, using the streams API within our service worker makes that possible. Now, you might have heard about the streams API before. My colleague, Jake Archibald, has been singing their praises for years now. 
made this bold prediction back in 2016. And the Streams API is just as awesome today as it was two years ago, but with a crucial difference. While only Chrome supported the Streams back then, the Streams API is much more widely supported now. All right, so now careful observers might note that asterisk. So here are the caveats for today. Firefox's support for streams is behind a flag, and it's not yet enabled by default, but you could try it out if you go in and manually make that change. And there's also a known bug that could lead to issues with Edge's current streams implementation. But the overall story is positive, and with appropriate fallback code, there's nothing stopping you from using streams in your service worker today. Well, there might be one thing stopping you, and that's wrapping your head around how the Streams API actually works. It exposes a very powerful set of primitives, and developers who are comfortable using it can create really complex data flows. But understanding the full implications of code similar to what's on the screen right now might not be for everyone. Rather than parse through this logic, let's talk about my approach to service worker streaming. So I'm using a brand new high-level wrapper provided by Workbox. I can pass it in a mix of streaming sources, both from caches and runtime data that might come from the network. Workbox will take care of coordinating the individual sources and stitching them together into a single streaming response. Moreover, Workbox automatically detects whether the streams API is supported, and when it's not, it creates an equivalent, though non-streaming, response. This means that you don't have to worry about writing fallbacks as streams inch closer to 100% browser support. All right, let's turn our attention to how our service worker deals with runtime data from the Stack Exchange API. So we're making use of Workbox's built-in support for a stale while we validate caching strategy, along with expiration to ensure that our storage doesn't grow unbounded. Let's take a look at how those concepts translate into code. Here, we set up two strategies in Workbox to handle the different sources that will make up the final streaming response. In a few function calls and some configuration, Workbox lets us do what would otherwise take hundreds or even thousands of lines of handwritten code. So the first strategy will be used to read data that's been pre-cached, like our partial HTML templates. The other strategy implements that still while we validate caching logic along with the least recently used cache expiration once we reach 50 entries. Now that we have those strategies in place, all that's left is to tell Workbox how to use them to construct a complete streaming response. We pass in an array of sources as functions, and each of those functions will be executed immediately. Workbox takes the result from each source and streams it to the web app in sequence, only delaying if the next function in the array hasn't completed yet. So the first two sources are pre-cached partial templates that read directly from the cache storage API. And so they'll always be available immediately. This ensures that our service worker implementation will be reliably fast in responding to requests, just like our server-side code was. Our next source function fetches data from the Stack Exchange API and processes the response into the HTML that our web app expects. The stale while we validate strategy means that if we have a previously cached response for this API call, we'll be able to stream it to the page immediately while updating the cache entry in the background for the next time that it's requested. Finally, we stream in a cached copy of our footer and close our final HTML tags to complete the response. So 
Now that we've run through the service worker code, certain bits hopefully look familiar. The partial HTML and templating logic used by our service worker is identical to what our server-side handler uses. This code sharing ensures that users get a consistent experience, whether they're visiting our web app for the first time or if they're returning to a page that's been rendered by the service worker. That's the beauty of using isomorphic JavaScript. OK, so we've walked through both the server and the service worker for a PWA. But there's one last bit of logic to cover. There's a small amount of JavaScript that runs on each of our pages after they're fully streamed in. This code progressively enhances the user experience, but it isn't crucial. The web app will still work if it's not run. So one thing we're using client-side JavaScript for is to update a page's metadata based on the API response. Because we end up using the same initial bit of cached HTML for each page, we end up with generic tags in our document's head. But through coordination with, between our templating and our client-side code, we could update the window's title using page-specific metadata. So as part of the templating code, we include a script tag containing the properly escaped string. Then, once our page is loaded, we read in that string and we update the document title. Now, if there are other pieces of page-specific metadata you want to update in your own web app, you could follow the same approach. So the other progressive enhancement we've added is used to bring attention to our offline capabilities. And we've built a reliable PWA, and we want our users to know that when they're offline, they could still load previously visited pages. We do this in two stages. First, we use the cache storage API from within the context of our client-side JavaScript. It gives us a list of all the previously cached API requests, and we translate that into a list of URLs. Remember that special data attribute we talked about containing the URL for the API request needed to display a question? So we could cross-reference those data attributes against the list of cached URLs and create an array of all the question links that don't match. And this gives us all the data we need to create handlers that respond to the browser going online or offline. So when a browser enters an offline state, we loop through the list of uncached links and dim out the ones that won't work. So keep in mind that this is just a visual hint to the user about what they should expect from those pages. We're not actually disabling the links or preventing the user from navigating. And when the browser comes back online, we restore those links to their original opacity. All right, we've now gone through a tour of my approach to building a multi-page PWA. There's a lot of factors that you'll have to consider when coming up with your own approach. And you may end up making different choices than I did. And that flexibility is one of the great things about building for the web. But there are a few common pitfalls that you may encounter when making your own architectural decisions. And I wanted to call them out in advance to hopefully save you some pain. So first, I'd really rec recommend against storing complete HTML documents in your cache. For one thing, it's a waste of space. If your web app uses the same basic HTML structure for each of its pages, you'll end up storing copies of the same markup again and again. More importantly, though, let's say you deploy a change to your site's shared HTML structure. Each one of those previously cached pages is still stuck with your old layouts. You can imagine the frustration when return visitors come back and see a mix of old and new pages, depending upon whether they've previously visited a given URL. So the other pitfall to avoid involves your server and your service worker getting out of sync. 
My approach was to use isomorphic JavaScript so that the same code was always run in both places. But depending upon your existing server architecture, that's not always possible. Whatever architectural decision you end up making, you need to have some strategy for running the equivalent routing and templating code in your server and your server work, service worker. So what happens when you ignore those pitfalls? Well, all sorts, all sorts of failures are possible. But the worst case scenario is that a user returns to your site and navigates around, eventually revisiting a cached page with a very stale layout. So it's jarring when you see it happen during a presentation, and it's just as distracting for your web app's repeat visitors. So do everything you can to avoid this. Alternatively, they might come across a URL that's handled by your server, but is no longer handled by your service worker. An experience full of zombie layouts and routing dead ends is the opposite of shipping a reliable PWA. But you're not in this alone. The following tips can help you avoid those pitfalls. Try to use templating and routing libraries that have JavaScript implementations. Now, I know that not every developer has the luxury of migrating off your current web server and templating language. But a number of popular, temp popular templating and routing frameworks have implementations in multiple languages. If you could find one that works with JavaScript as well as your current server's language, you're one step closer to keeping your service worker and your server in sync. Next, I recommend using a series of sequential templates that can be streamed in one right after another. It's OK if later portions of your page use more complicated templating logic, as long as you could stream in the initial parts of your HTML as quickly as possible. For best performance, you should pre-cache all of your site's critical static resources. You should also set up a runtime caching route to handle dynamic content, like API requests. Using Workbox means that you can build on top of well-tested, production-ready strategies instead of implementing it all from scratch. And related to that, you should only block on the network when it's not possible to stream a response from the cache. Displaying a cached API response immediately can often lead to a better user experience than waiting for that fresh data. So if you follow the general guidelines that I've covered today, you're on your way to building a first-class PWA experience, an experience that's fast, loading as little as possible from the network. In the case of my Stack Overflow PWA, almost all the bytes we're loading are for actual content with almost no overhead. And building an experience that's reliable by displaying something meaningful, even when you're offline. Our PWA uses visual cues to reinforce that we're providing a reliable experience. And an experience that's reliably fast by streaming in our initial HTML immediately, followed by page-specific content, regardless of the network conditions. So that about wraps it up for me. We're interested in your feedback on this presentation. Please go to our website or use the Android or iOS apps to let us know what you think. And if you want to learn more about the topics covered, these links will help. So thanks to everybody for watching. Thank you.